This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Discourse on the Method of Rightly Conducting One's Reason and of Seeking Truth in the Sciences by René Descartes Part 5 Recording by Eric Jean, Montreal, Quebec I would here willingly have proceeded to exhibit the whole chain of truths which I deduced from these primary, but as with a view to this it would have been necessary now to treat of many questions in dispute amongst the learned, with whom I do not wish to be embroiled, I believe that it will be better for me to refrain from this exposition, and only mention in general what these truths are, that the more judicious may be able to determine whether a more special account of them would conduce to the public advantage. I have ever remained firm in my original resolution to suppose no other principle than that of which I have recently availed myself in demonstrating the existence of God and of the soul, and to accept as true nothing that did not appear to me more clear and certain than the demonstration of the geometers had formerly appeared. And yet, I venture to state that not only have I found the means to satisfy myself in a short time on all the principal difficulties which are usually treated of in philosophy, but I have also observed certain laws established in nature by God in such a manner, and of which he has impressed on our minds such notions, that after we have reflected sufficiently upon these, we cannot doubt that they are accurately observed in all that exists or takes place in the world and farther, by considering the concatenation of these laws, it appears to me that I have discovered many truths more useful and more important than all I had before learned, or even had expected to learn. But because I have essayed to expound the chief of these discoveries in a treatise which certain considerations prevent me from publishing, I cannot make the results known more conveniently than by here giving a summary of the contents of this treatise. It was my design to comprise in it all that, before I set myself to write it, I thought I knew of the nature of material objects. But like the painters who, finding themselves unable to represent equally well on a plain surface all of the different faces of a solid body, select one of the chief, on which alone they make the light fall, and throwing the rest into the shade, allow them to appear only in so far as they can be seen while looking on the principal one. So fearing lest I should not be able to compense in my discourse all that was in my mind, I resolved to expound singly, though at considerable length, my opinion regarding light, then to take the opportunity of adding something on the sun and fixed stars, since light almost wholly proceeds from them, on the heavens since they transmit it, on the planets, comets, and earth since they reflect it, and particularly on all the bodies that are upon the earth, since they are either colored, or transparent, or luminous, and finally on man, since he is the spectator of these objects. Further, to enable me to cast this variety of subjects somewhat into the shade, and to express my judgment regarding them with greater freedom, without being necessitated to adopt or refute the opinions of the learned, I resolve to leave all the people here to their disputes and to speak only of what would happen in a new world, if God were now to create somewhere in the imaginary spaces matter sufficient to compose one, and were to agitate variously and confusedly the different parts of this matter, so that there resulted a chaos as disordered as the poets ever feigned, and after that did nothing more than lend his ordinary concurrence to nature, and allow her to act in accordance with the laws which he had established." On this supposition I, in the first place, described this matter, and essayed to represent it in such a matter that to my mind there can be nothing clearer and more intelligible, except what has been recently said regarding God and the soul. For I even expressly supposed that it possessed none of those forms or qualities which are so debated in the schools, nor in general anything the knowledge of which is not so natural to our minds that no one can so much as imagine himself ignorant of it. Besides, 
I have pointed out what are the laws of nature, and with no other principle upon which to found my reasonings except the infinite perfection of God, I endeavored to demonstrate all those about which there could be any room for doubt, and to prove that there are such, that even if God had created more worlds, there could have been none in which these laws were not observed. Thereafter, I showed how the greatest part of the matter of this chaos must, in accordance with these laws, dispose and arrange itself in such a way as to present the appearance of heavens, how in the meantime some of its parts must compose an earth, and some planets and comets, and others a sun and fixed stars. And making a digression at this stage on the subject of light, I expounded at considerable length what the nature of that light must be which is found in the sun and the stars, and how thence in an instant of time it traverses the immense spaces of the heavens, and how from the planets and comets it is reflected towards the earth. To this I likewise added much respecting the substance, the situation, the motions, and all the different qualities of these heavens and stars, so that I thought I had said enough respecting them to show that there is nothing observable in the heavens or stars of our system that must not, or at least may not, appear precisely alike in those of the system which I described. I came next to speak of the earth in particular, and to show how, even though I had expressly supposed that God had given no weight to the matter of which it is composed, this should not prevent all its parts from tending exactly to its center, how with water and air on its surface, the disposition of the heavens and heavenly bodies, more especially of the moon, must cause a flow and ebb, like in all its circumstances, to that observed in our seas, as also a certain current both of water and air from east to west, such as is likewise observed between the tropics, how the mountains, seas, fountains, and rivers might naturally be formed in it, and the metals produced in the mines, and the plants grown in the fields and in general, how all the bodies which are commonly denominated mixed or composite might be generated and, among other things in the discoveries alluded to, inasmuch as beside the stars, I knew nothing except fire which produces light. I spared no pains to set forth all that pertains to its nature, the manner of its production and support, and to explain how heat is sometimes found without light, and light without heat, to show how it can induce various colors upon different bodies and other diverse qualities, how it reduces some to a liquid state and hardens others, how it can consume almost all bodies, or convert them into ashes and smoke. And finally, how from these ashes, by the mere intensity of its actions, it forms glass. For as this transmutation of ashes into glass appeared to me as wonderful as any other in nature, I took a special pleasure in describing it. I was not, however, disposed from these circumstances to conclude that this world had been created in the manner I described, for it is much more likely that God made it at the first such as it was to be. But this is certain, and an opinion commonly received among theologians, that the action by which he now sustains it is the same with that by which he originally created it, so that even although he had from the beginning giving it no other form than that of chaos, provided only he had established certain laws of nature, and had lent it his concurrence to enable it to act as it is wont to do, it may be believed, without discredit to the miracle of creation, that, in this way alone, things purely material might, in course of time, have become such as we observe them as present, and their nature is much more easily conceived when they are beheld coming in this matter gradually into existence, that when they are only considered as produced at once in a finished and perfect state. From the description of inanimate bodies and plants, I passed to animals, and particularly to man. But since I had not as yet sufficient knowledge to enable me to treat of these in the same manner as the rest, that is to say, by deducing effects from their causes, and by showing from what elements and in what, ma what manner nature must produce them, I remained satisfied with the supposition that God formed the body of man 
wholly like the one of ours, as well in the external shape of the members as in the internal conformation of the organs of the same matter with that I had described, and at first placed in it no rational soul, nor any other principle, in room of the vegetative or sensitive soul, beyond kindling in the heart one of those fires without light, so as I had already described, and which I thought was not different from the heat in hay that has been heaped together before it is dry, or that which causes fermentation in new wines before they are run clear of the fruit. For when I examined the kind of functions which might, as consequences of this supposition, exist in this body, I found precisely all those which may exist in us independently of all power of, th and th of thinking, and consequently without being in any measure owing to the soul. In other words, to that part of us which is distinct from the body, and of which it has been said above that the nature distinctively consists in thinking, functions in which the animals void of reason may be said wholly to resemble us, but among which I could not discover any of those that, as dependent on thought alone, belong to us as men, while, on the other hand, I did afterwards discover these as soon as I supposed God to have created a rational soul, and to have annexed it to this body in a particular manner which I described. But in order to show how I there handled this matter, I mean here to give the explication of the motion of the heart and arteries, which, as the first and most general motion observed in animals, will afford the means of readily determining what should be thought of all the rest. And that there may be less difficulty and understand what I am about to say on the subject, I advise those who are not versed in anatomy, before they commence the perusal of these observations, to take the trouble of getting dissected in their presence the heart of some large animal possessed of lungs, for this is thoroughly sufficiently like the human and to have shown to them its two ventricles, or cavities. In the first place, that in the right side, with which correspond two very ample twos, viz. the hollow vein, vena cava, which is the principal receptacle of the blood, and the trunk of the tree, as it were, of which all the other veins in the body are branches, and the arterial vein, vena arteriosa, inappropriately so denominated, since it is in truth only an artery, which, taking its rise in the heart, is divided, after passing out from it, into many branches which pres presently disperse themselves all over the lungs. In the second place, the cavity in the left side, with which correspond the same manner two canals in size equal to or larger than the preceding, viz. the venous artery, arteria venosa, likewise inappropriately thus designated, because it is simply a vein which comes from the lungs, where it is divided into many branches, interlaced with those of the arterial vein, and those of the tube called the windpipe, through which the air we breathe enters, and the great artery which, issuing from the heart, sends its branches all over the body. I should wish also that such persons were carefully shown the eleven pellicles, which, like so many small valves, open and shut the four orifices that are in these two cavities, viz. three at the entrance of the hollow veins, where they are disposed in such a manner as by no means to prevent the blood which it contains from flowing into the right ventricle of the heart, and yet exactly to prevent its flowing out, three at the entrance to the arterial vein, which, arranged in a manner exactly the opposite of the former, readily permits the blood contained in this cavity to pass into the lungs, but hinder that contained in the lungs from returning to this cavity, and, in the like manner, two others at the mouth of the venous artery, which allow the blood from the lungs to flow into the left cavity of the heart, but precludes its return, and three at the mouth of the great artery, which suffer the blood to flow from the heart, but prevent its reflux. Nor do we need to seek any other reason for the number of these pellicles beyond this, that the orifice of the venous artery being of an oval shape from the nature of its situation can be adequately closed with two, whereas the others, being round, are more conveniently closed with three. Besides, I wish such persons to observe that the grand artery and the arterial vein 
are of much harder and firmer texture than the venous artery and the hollow vein, and that the last two expand before entering the heart, and there form, as it were, two pouches denominated the auricles of the heart, which are composed of a substance similar to that of the heart itself, and that there is always more warmth in the heart than in any other part of the body, and finally, that this heat is capable of causing any drop of blood that passes into the cavities rapidly to expand and dilate, just as all liquors do when allowed to fall drop by drop into a highly heated vessel. For after these things, it is not necessary for me to say anything more with a view to explain the motion of the heart, except that when its cavities are not full of blood, into these the blood of necessity flows, from the hollow vein into the right, and from the venous artery into the left, because these two vessels are always full of blood, and their orifices, which are turned towards the heart, cannot then be closed. But as soon as two drops of blood have thus passed, one into each of the cavities, these drops which cannot be but very large, because the orifices through which they pass are wide, and the vessels from which they come are full of blood, are immediately rarefied and dilated by the heat they met with. In this way they cause the whole heart to expand, and at the same time press home and shut the five small valves that are at the entrances of the two vessels from which they flow, and thus prevent any more blood from coming down to the heart, and becoming more and more rarefied, they push open the six small valves that are in the orifices of the other two vessels, through which they pass out, causing in this way all the branches of the arterial vein and of the grand artery to expand almost simultaneously with the heart which immediately thereafter begins to contract, as do also the arteries, because the blood that has entered into them has cooled, and the six small valves close, and the five of the hollow veins and of the venous artery open anew and allow a passage to two other drops of blood, which cause the heart and the arteries again to expand as before. And because the blood which thus enters into the heart passage through these two pouches called auricles, it thence happens that their motion is the contrary of that of the heart, and that when it expands they contract. But lest those who are ignorant of the force of mathematical demonstrations, and who are not accustomed to distinguish true reasons from mere verisimilitudes, should venture, without examination, to deny what has been said, I wish it to be considered that the motion which I have now explained follows as necessarily from the very arrangement of the parts, which may be observed in the heart by the eye alone, and from the heat which may be felt with the fingers, and from the nature of the blood as learned from experience, as does the motion of a clock from the power, the situation, and shape of its counterweights and wheels. But if it be asked how it happens that the blood in the veins, flowing in this way continually into the heart, is not exhausted, and why the arteries do not become too full, since all the blood which passes through the heart flows into them, I need only mention in reply what has been written by a physician of England, who has the honor of having broken the ice on this subject, and of having been the first to teach that there are many small passages at the extremities of the arteries, through which the blood received by them from the heart passes into the small branches of the veins, whence it again returns to the heart, so that its course amounts precisely to a perpetual circulation. Of this we have abundant proof in the ordinary experience of surgeons, who, by binding the arm with a tie of moderate straightness above the part where they open the vein, cause the blood to flow more copiously than it would have done without any ligature, whereas quite the contrary would happen were they to bind it below, that is, between the hand and the opening, or were to make the ligature above the opening very tight. For it is manifest that the tie, moderately straightened, while adequate to hinder the blood already in the arm from returning towards the heart by the veins, cannot on that account prevent new blood from coming forward through the arteries, because these are situated below the veins, and their coverings, from their greater consistency, are more difficult to compress, and also that the blood, which comes from the heart, tends to pass through them to the hand with greater force than it does to return from the hand to the heart through the veins. 
and since the latter current escapes from the arm by the opening made in one of the veins, there must of necessity be certain passages below the ligature, that is, towards the extremities of the arm through which it can come thither from the arteries. This physician likewise abundantly establishes what he has advanced respecting the motion of the blood from the exert existence of certain pellicles, so disposed in various places among the course of the veins in the matter of small valves, as not to permit the blood to pass from the middle of the body towards the extremities, but only to return from the extremities to the heart, and farther from experience which shows that all the blood which is in a body may flow out of it in a very short time through a single artery that has been cut, and although this has been closely tied in an immediate neighborhood of the heart and cut between the heart and the ligature, so as to prevent the supposition that the blood flowing out of it could come from any other quarter than the heart. But there are many other circumstances which evince that what I have alleged is the true cause of the motion of the blood. Thus, in the first place, the difference that is observed between the blood which flows from the veins and that from the arteries can only arise from this, that being rarefied and, as it were, distilled by passing through the heart, it is thinner and more vivid and warmer immediately after leaving the heart, in other words, when in the arteries, than it was a short time before passing into either, in other words, when it was in the veins. And if attention be given, it will be found that this difference is very marked only in the neighborhood of the heart, and is not so evident in parts more remote from it. In the next place, the consistency of the coats of which the arterial vein and the greater artery are composed sufficiently shows that the blood is impelled against them with more force than against the veins. And why should the left cavity of the heart and the great artery be wider and larger than the right cavity and the arterial vein, were it not that the blood of the venous artery, having only been in the lungs after it has passed through the heart, is thinner, and rarefies more readily, and in a higher degree, than the blood which proceeds immediately from the hollow veins? And what can physicians conjecture from feeling the pulse, unless they know that according as the blood changes its nature, it can be rarefied by the warmth of the heart, in a higher or lower degree, and more or less quickly than before. And if it be inquired how this heat is communicated to the other members, must it not be admitted that this is effected by means of the blood, which, passing through the heart, is there heated anew, and thence diffused all the body? Once it happens, that if the blood be withdrawn from any part, the heat is likewise withdrawn by the same means. And although the heart were as hot as glowing iron, it would not be capable of warming the feet and hands as at present, unless it continually sent thither new blood. We likewise perceive from this that the true use of respiration is to bring sufficient fresh air into the lungs, to cause the blood which flows into them from the right ventricle of the heart, where it has been rarefied and, as it were, changed into vapors, to become thick, and to convert it anew into blood, before it flows into the less cavity without which process it would be unfit for the nourishment of the fire that is there. This receives confirmation from the circumstance that it is observed of animals destitute of lungs that they have also but one cavity in the heart, and that in children who cannot use them while in the womb, there is a hole through which the blood flows from the hollow vein into the left cavity of the heart, and a tube through which it passes from the arterial vein into the grand artery without passing through the lung. In the next place, how could digestion be carried on in the stomach unless the heart communicated heat to it through the arteries, and along with this certain of the more fluid parts of the blood, which assist in the dissolution of the food that has been taken in? Is not also the operation which converts the juice of food into blood easily comprehended when it is considered that it is distilled by passing and repassing through the heart perhaps more than one or two hundred times in a day? And what more need be adduced to explain nutrition and the production of the different humors of the body, beyond saying that the force with which the blood, in being rarefied, passes from the heart towards the extremities of the arteries, causes certain of its parts to remain in the members at which they arrive, 
and there occupy the place of some other expelled by them, and that according to the situation, shape, or smallness of the pores which which they meet, some rather than others flow into certain parts in the same way that some sieves are observed to act, which, by being variously perforated, serve to separate different species of grain. And, in the last place, what above all is here worthy of observation is the generation of the animal spirits, which are like a very subtle wind, or rather a very pure and vivid flame, which, continuously ascending in great abundance from the heart to the brain, thence penetrates through the nerves into the muscles and give motions to all the members, so that to account for other parts of the blood which, as most agitated and penetrating, are the fittest to compose these spirits, thence penetrates through the nerves into the muscles and gives motion to all the members, so that to account for other parts of the blood which, as more agitated and penetrating, are the fittest to compose these spirits, proceeding towards the brain, it is not necessary to suppose any other cause than simply that the arteries which carry them thither proceed from the heart in the most direct lines, and that, according to the rules of mechanics which are the same with those of nature, when many objects tend at once to the same point, where is not sufficient room for all, as is the case with the parts of the blood which flow forth from the left cavity of the heart and tend towards the brain, the weaker and less agitated parts must necessarily be driven aside from that point by the stronger, which alone in this way reach it. I had expounded all these matters with sufficient minuteness in the treaties which I formerly thought of publishing. And after these I had shown what must be the fabric of the nerves and muscle of the human body to give the animal spirits contained in it the power to move the members, as when we see heads shortly after they have been struck off still move and bite the earth, although no longer animated. What changes must take place in the brain to produce waking, sleep, and dreams? How light, sounds, odors, tastes, heat, and all the other qualities of external objects impress it with different ideas by means of the senses. How hunger, thirst, and the other internal affections can likewise impress upon it diverse ideas, what must be understood by the common sense, sensus communis, in which these ideas are received, by the memory which retains them, by the fantasy which can change them in various ways, and out of them compose new ideas, and which, by the same means, distributing the animal spirits through the muscles, can cause the members of such a body to move in as many different ways, and in a matter as suited, whether to the objects that are presented to its senses, or to its internal affections, as can take place in our own case, apart from the guidance of the will. Nor will this appear at all strange to those who are acquainted with the variety of movements performed by the different automata, or moving machines fabricated by human industry, and that, with help of but few pieces compared with the great multitude of bones, muscles, nerves, arteries, veins, and other parts that are found in the body of each animal. Such persons will look upon this body as a machine made by the hands of God, which is incomparably better arranged, and adequate to movements more admirable than is any machine of human invention. And here I specially stayed to show that, were there such machines exactly resembling organs in outward form an ape or any other irrational animal, we could have no means of knowing that they were in any respect of a different nature from these animals. But if there were machines bearing the image of our bodies, and capable of imitating our actions as far as it is morally possible, there would still remain two most certain tests whereby to know that they were not, therefore, really men. Of these the first is that they could never use words or other signs arranged in such a manner as is competent to us in order to declare our thoughts to others. For we may easily conceive a machine to be so constructed that it emits vocables, and even that it emits some correspondent to the action upon it of external objects which cause a change in its organs. For example, if touched in a particular place, it may depend what we wish to say to it. If in another, it may cry out that it is hurt, and such like. But not that it should arrange them variously as so oppositely to reply to what is said in its presence, as men of the lowest grade of intellect can do.
The second test is that although such machines might execute many things with equal or perhaps greater perfection than any of us, they would, without doubt, fail in certain others from which it could be discovered that they did not act from knowledge, but solely from disposition of their organs. For while reason is a universal instrument that is alike available on every occasion, these organs, on the contrary, need a particular arrangement for each particular action, whence it must be morally impossible that there should exist in any machine a diversity of organs sufficient to enable it to act in all the occurrences of life, in the way in which our reason enables us to act. Again, by means of these two tests we may likewise know the difference between man and brute, for it is highly deserving of remark that there are no men so dull and stupid, not even idiots, as to be incapable of joining together different words, and thereby constructing a declaration by which to make their thoughts understood, and that, on the other hand, there is no other animal, however perfect or happily circumstanced, which can do the like. Nor does this inability arise from want of organs, for we observe that magpies and parrots can utter words like ourselves, and are yet unable to speak as we do, that is, so as to show that they understood what they say, in place of which men born deaf and dumb, and thus not less, but rather more than these brutes, destitute of the organs which others use in speaking, are in the habit of spontaneously investing certain signs by which they discover their thoughts to those who, being usually in their company, have leisure to learn their language. And this proves not only that the brutes have less reason than man, but that they have none at all. For we see that very little is required to enable a person to speak, and since a certain inequality of capacity is observable among animals of the same species, as well as among men, and since some are more capable of being instructed than others, it is incredible that the most perfect ape or parrot of its species should not in this be equal to the most stupid infant of its kind, or at least to one that was crack-brained, unless the soul of brutes were of a na nature wholly different from ours. And we ought not to confound speech with the natural movements which indicate the passions, and can be imitated by machines as well as manifested by animals. Nor must it be thought with certain of the ancients, that the brutes speak, although we do not understand their language. For if such were the case, since they are endowed with many organs analogous to ours, they could as easily communicate their thoughts to us as to their fellows. It is also very worthy to remark that, though there are many animals which manifest more industry than we in certain of their actions, the same animals are yet observed to show none at all in many others so that the circumstance that they do better, that we does not prove that they are endowed with mind, for it would thence follow that they possess greater reason than any of us, and could surpass us in all things. On the contrary, it rather proves that they are destitute of reason, and that it is nature which acts in them according to the disposition of their organs. Thus it is seen that a clock composed only of wheels and weights can number the hours and measure time more exactly than we with all our skin. I had, after this, described the reasonable soul, and shown that it could by no means be adduced from the power of matter, as the other things of which I had spoken, but that it must be expressly created, and that it is not sufficient that it be lodged in the human body exactly like a pilot in a ship, unless perhaps to move its members, but that it is necessary for it to be joined and united more closely to the body, in order to have sensations and appetites similar to ours, and thus constitute a real man. I here entered, in conclusion, upon the subject of the soul at considerable length, because it is of the greatest moment. For after the error of those who deny the existence of God, an error which I think I have already sufficiently refuted, there is none that is more powerful in leading feeble minds astray from the straight path of virtue than the supposition that the soul of the brutes is of the same nature as our own. And consequently, that after this life we have nothing to hope for our fears, more than flies and ants, in place of which, when we know how far they differ, we much better comprehend the reasons which establish that the soul is of a nature wholly independent of the body, and that consequently it is not liable to die with the latter, and, finally, 
because no other causes are observ capable of destroying it, we are naturally led thence to judge that it is immortal. End of part five.